generated around a living being by their cells, forming an electrically charged magnetic dipole, then the Earth fits this definition if we consider that we are the living cells who comprise the unique patterns inside the electromagnetic field of the planet Earth. The Earth exerts a magnetic pull on the positive end of a smaller magnet toward the south pole now because the south pole of planet Earth exerts a positive field of ions. These ions arc outward and around the Earth in an electromagnetic torus to return to the Earth's north polar regions in a greatly diminished sum. Because the ions of the current North Pole fail to ionize the water there, it does not desalinate and can thus not form into the massive ice sheets of glaciers. The occasional reversal of the Earth's electromagnetic polarity corresponds to the great north-south, north-south cycling of ice ages. In the same way Earth experiences its seasons due to the 23.5 degree tilt of its inclination from its orbital ecliptic plane, it experiences its magnetic pole reversals due to the gradual recombination of locations of the geographic and magnetic poles until at the apex of the sunspot cycle they exactly overlap and this event begins the magnetic pole reversal process which moves the magnetic pole away from the geographic pole at an even more rapid rate than it had approached it before they recombined. This same offsetting of the physical and invisible force field poles occurs in the orders of each and every person and forms the differences between us that make each of our souls unique. The soul is an emanation originating within the chakras, and because the chakras can be associated with the seven color spectrum, we would expect to see the aura reflecting the influence on it of each of the chakras by appearing to emanate in its correspondent hue in the seven color spectrum. This has been the case in all art that depicts the chakras and their invisible field of personal electromagnetism. From the modern works such as this airbrushing of a mind ascending the confines of the soul surrounding the body by achieving satori, the trance of samadhi or nirvana, in which one knows all, becomes all, and is all. This is embodied in the ancient Vedic expression, Satchit Ananda, meaning essentially truth, consciousness, and bliss. In this tanka of Siddhartha, we see the Buddha expressed as the four elements permeated within, between and across them by the seven chakras, as a central double spiral. This is the Buddha achieving Krishna consciousness, or oneness with the divine cosmic mind of the all. Because the Buddha achieved oneness with the divine cosmic mind of the all, he was said to be an avatar or lesser material physical incarnation of Vishnu, and thus also all the subsequent Dalai Lamas are believed by Tibetan Buddhists to be avatars or later reincarnations of the Buddha. As we have seen, the twelve Chinese meridians and the seven Vedic chakras have proven to be legitimate neurons in ganglii and plexi, forming the central and peripheral nervous systems. Thus, it also stands to reason that, in spite of modern Western medicine considering it parapsychology, implying a self-induced delusion, the electrical charge of the nervous system can generate a magnetic dipole field that surrounds the body of a living being. However, can science further prove the soul can leave the body at the time of the body's death? Let us delve deeper into these so-called mysteries of religious metaphysics. We can see in this diagram from Western medicine how five nerve centers comprise the autonomic or unconsciously functioning nervous system, which controls the functions of our organs without our needing to think about them to make them work. The lowest controls the gonads, bladder, kidney, and rectum. The second up controls the large and small intestines, adrenal gland, pancreas, 
liver, the abdominal blood vessels, and the stomach. The third controls the heart and lungs. The fourth controls the tear gland, nose palate, submaxillary and sublingual glands, and the mouth salivary gland. The fifth controls the eyes. These are almost identical to the ancient charts showing the seven chakras. The chakras, however, are indeed real nerve centers. The difference between the seven chakras and the five centers of the autonomic nervous system are that the chakras count the solar plexus as part of the same nerve system as the sacral plexus, and the five centers of the autonomic nervous system do not include the crown chakra, symbolic of the entire cerebral cortex. The seven chakra are, thus, in ascending order, Muladhara, the coccygeal plexus, Svadhisthana, the sacral plexus, Manipura, the solar plexus, Anahata, the pulmonary and cardiac plexi, Vishuddhi, the pharyngeal plexus, the Ajna, the carotid plexus, and Sahasrara, the cerebral cortex. In this chart from Western medicine, we see the twelve Chinese meridians can be thought to correspond with these twelve functions over different motor control in various parts of the lower brain. We see the sensory fibers, or read-only neurons, are colored in red, and the motor fibers, or write-only neurons, are colored in blue. Each portion of the underside of the brain serves to control one cluster of motor fiber neurons and responds to only sensations from that specific cluster of neurons. In considering this model, we should also consider the nature of the bicameral brain. The cerebral cortex, the gray matter tissue of our brain's outermost, thickest layer, is divided dorsally in two hemispheres, a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. The right hemisphere of the brain is responsible for sensory and motor activity in the left side of the body, and the left hemisphere of the brain is responsible for sensory and motor activity in the right side of the body. They are reversed as they pass through the hypothalamus, which serves as the primary conduit between the uppermost brain stem of the spine and the lowermost cortices and glands of the cerebrum. The brain is here labeled as the seat of no less than 12 senses, however we will break these down into the general five categories of sight, the anterior cortex and hindbrain, sound, the fissures correspondent on either side to a spot above the ears, smell, below the forebrain's frontal cortex tissues, speech, in fissures on either side just in front of the ear fissures, Sense, combining motor control and touch and pressure centers around the topmost area of the cerebrum. And taste, fissures paired on either side just above the hearing sensory fissures. Confirming the long-held belief in the brain being the seat of the soul, there are also fissures in the aft quarter of both hemispheres that relate to the arts of communication, gestural, language, and reading skills. The ancients perceived the pineal gland as central to the brain, just as they perceived Earth to be the core of the infinite cosmos. Were they wrong to do so? Now that we have the X-ray and EEG imaging technology capable of peering into every little corner, nook, and cranny of the cerebellum, and we have not found one single cell responsible solely for the role of self-aware consciousness, i.e. a soul, Perhaps it is time to look elsewhere and outside of only the basic brain for such an energy. With x-rays we can depict the brain, but only with sonic frequencies can we seek to heal brain tumors without using any invasive surgical procedure. Likewise, we can depict using Corellian photography the energy field that surrounds all objects, such as that emanating from this nautilus shell which lingers in the object long after the life inside it has departed. 
In the case of this nautilus shell, the mollusk that usually inhabits it is gone, yet the shell itself glows with bolts of blue, pink, and white light. If this energy field shown in Corellian photography is, indeed, the substance of the soul as an aura surrounding a living being, then it indicates the soul does not leave the body at the time of death, but stays with it until it is entirely deteriorated to the point it can no longer radiate thermal energy or emit radioactive carbon element 14. Even more significant than that finding, if indeed it does apply to the soul, is the discovery via Corellian photography that non-living matter can have a soul too. Modern Science Part 1b The Corellian Aura Using a device called a Corellian photography machine, we can photograph the aura. The device uses a flat metal plate with a camera underneath it. When an object is placed on the plate and a low level of electrical current is run through the metal, a photograph taken through the metal plate of the underside of the object placed on top of it will also show the small electrical charge casting bolts across field lines as the current in the metal plate is transducted into the object set on top of it. Some would contest that, because it is being amplified by the charged plate, the energy captured in the photograph is not native to the object being depicted. However, the introduction of electricity into an object will still react in only one of two ways. One way, sparks, for a living object, and another, glows, for an inanimate object. Also, the color scale established between them, with blue sparks depicting for a living object and a red glow emanating evenly for a dead or inanimate object, is unique to Corellian photos. Long exposure Corellian photographs, such as this one of an apple, can show the amount of life an object has in it, as the high end of the blue end of the lifeline color spectrum of Corellian photos fades to a bright white light the longer the exposure time. Long exposures of living objects can, however, be confused for high amplitude short exposure photos of non-living objects because in both there is a high voltage of white light depicted. However, as we see in this Corellian photo of a half an apple, a long exposure of a living object shows the white shifting of the blue sparks, while the white light in any duration of exposure time of a dead object will only depict the amplitude of the electrical current being passed through it. The aura of living objects depicted in Corellian photos is a combination of the current being passed through the metal plate and the natural electrical charge of the living object. The result, as we see here in this depiction of a pair of human hands, shows up in Corellian photos as a halo of blue sparks formed between the living object and the metal plate. Where the hands are pressed against the plate, these blue sparks appear to form halos or an aura the light of which actually illuminates the rest of the hands, which are not touching the metal plate, but which are still visible in this photo. The white light of these blue sparks distinguishes a living object from the darkness or red glow of an inanimate object. The dark red glow of a dead object should not be confused with the pale light of the blue sparks that can reflect from the surface of the metal plate to illuminate the rest of the living object in a Corellian photograph. As the medium length, medium amplitude depiction of a leaf on the left shows, the life force is leaving the dying leaf. The edges are surrounded by a halo of blue sparks, while the interior of the leaves has begun to shift toward a dark red glow. In the Corellian photo of a metal key on the right, we see it emits no light from within it, 